I found out April 2009 that I had cancer and how I found out about it was I'd been going to the, my GP um, or a number of GPs for a long time complaining about being very, very tired. And they couldn't, they just kept on fogging me off and they couldn't work out what was wrong. Until I went to uh, a new GP that I um, was referred to and it took them about two days, I was in hospital, they couldn't identify what was wrong. It took them about two days to identify that I had stage four bowel cancer. I just turned um, 41 when I'd found out. We went to the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service and um, um, so they checked me over and a week later I'd gone back to see the doctor and they'd rang up for the results. And unfortunately, I, yeah, I was told that, um, that, it was a, uh, that I'd had breast cancer. Seven years ago, uh, I threw up and it was just black blood. So uh, I was taken to hospital and uh, they put a camera down and had a look around and uh, uh, they said, oh, you, you know, you've got an ulcer. And I said, I know a lot of people that uh, live with ulcers. And they said, no, it's a little bit worse than that, Kevin. It's a, it's a cancer, cancer of the esophagus. So it was really interesting about two years ago. Um, she rang me up, son, I need to come to Bell Ranald. I went back home, I was a bit puzzled. I thought, yeah, I think there's something going on, but she wouldn't tell me. So there's this period of time where nobody knew what was going on. It's only I actually got to talk to a doctor in Swan Hill that had been treating her. She actually told me what was going on. And she had this, she had cancer. But you didn't call it cancer. You think it's cancer. I was in the shower, um, 2012 and I was washing myself and I found this lump and I thought, oh yeah, it must be like a milk duck. Didn't think really anything of it. And then kind of like, yeah, a couple of weeks later, I told the girls at Mungab that I'd found the lump and my friend said, oh, you need to really go and get that checked out. Um, so I did. It was back in, um, at the end of May. I just went for a routine mammogram and an ultrasound. When the doctor said, look, the result's not good, um, we've found that it is, you've got breast cancer. However, the good thing is I got it early. It must be about four years ago. The doctor come from, came from Sydney, I think. And uh, I went to see her about coughing and sick in the stomach. So she sent me for x-ray. She put a little lump somewhere in the chest, so she wasn't satisfied, so she sent me back for another one. So I went back again and she said it was cancer. We lost mum in 2005, but I, she was diagnosed in about 2004, I think. Um, she went up to the hospital, she was getting chest pains. She thought it might have been a heart attack. Um, but then she was diagnosed with lung cancer. It was really, it was really hard to take because she automatically, automatically think, I'm going to die. I'm not going to survive this. I'm dead. And I started to think like that. At the time, you, you just don't know what to think or feel. You know, you, you don't know whether you're going to survive it or whether you're not going to. I did contemplate uh, suicide for a very short time, but it didn't last. But my wife has uh, been the, uh, the power person behind me, I guess. So she thought she was going to be fine. She talked it up, as she always does, my mother. And she said, look, I'll, I'll be fine. From uh, going from that in June to passing away in November was pretty quick. I swore at her because it was a way that, you know, they don't they don't have the capacity to have empathy. They just blurt it out. Never heard of, never heard of it before. I get in the olden days, didn't hear anything about cancer. I used to live off the land. No one had cancer then. Well, we're getting these diseases now because we're grown older. At that time, I wasn't quite sure what my journey was going to be, but um, yeah, I felt really out of control of things and yeah. Never think, thought it would be like it is now. It's a terrible thing to have. 
lose weight and everything, can't eat properly, can't sleep properly. I was very close to my mother. It took a big impact on myself and my kids and my sister. I went through treatment. I had two major surgeries. That was the first thing. They didn't put me on chemo or, or radiation straight away. They said, we really have to go in and take the tumour out. So I had two major operations, one on the bowel. They did that first and then they did the liver. And that's when they, when they went in to do the liver, that's when they discovered a little bit of it had gone to my diaphragm. So they cut that out at the same time. My fight was for my daughter, for myself second but my fight was for my daughter. So you'd wake, I'd wake up every day, you know, just saying, I have to do this, because I'm the only parent she has, and I'm not ready to leave her, let alone wasn't ready for myself to give up. I went into hospital weighing 74 kilos, pretty, pretty strong fella, and I, um, arms on me, me like that, and uh, I came home uh, ringing wet, uh, Six weeks later, uh, 39 kilos. So it's not a good way to lose weight. It was a pretty, pretty hard struggle, that was. I suppose for me was just managing that with my siblings. And they were saying, no, we'll see none of them, they really understand the health industry and how it works. Uh, different segments of the, sections of the health industry don't talk to each other very well or pass on information. So that was the frustrating part. I remember my mother was in um, the hospital and she was in enormous pain in, in, uh, in Bendigo and um, they were still running a whole bunch of tests but they wouldn't do anything for the pain, it was ridiculous. But she was a great one, she could pump herself up to, um, to look good and sound good when somebody was visiting and she would look like that and then she'd fall in a heap when you all went away. <laughs> so I think for the, the job for me was that um, talking to my siblings and they were saying, no, she said she'll be home for Christmas. I said, you don't understand how quick this stuff works. She could be here tomorrow, but she could be gone by next week. They couldn't comprehend it. So I went and did my first lot of chemo and I was sitting at home and I'm thinking, because <sighs> they told me that the hair would just basically start falling out. I'm like sitting there, I'm thinking, I am mentally, I know that I wouldn't be unable to handle that. So I got my partner's clippers and my daughter's clipping my hair and as it was, she was doing it, I was crying. And then um, I was completely bald. And I'm sitting there, my dad was crying and my mum was crying and I just looked at my daughter and I went, how sexy is this? I embraced it, seriously. I felt sexier than I'd ever felt in my entire life. Going into um, surgery, um, I had a really good bloke that was the anaesthetic bloke, and he said, yeah, he says, now what can I give you? <laughs> so he really, he just looked at my face and he said, looks like you've been through hell. And I said, today I have. So. I said, I just want this all over and done with. And he says, this is going to give you a little bit of a kick, like having a couple of glasses. I said, well, I don't drink white, so make it red. <laughs> uh, so then, yeah, so it was, um, yeah, interesting. But he was the one person that just saw maybe what I was going through that day and just connected. I had it before and I had a keel operation on it. And I was right for, oh, I've got 12 months or more. And then it came back again on the same side. When she was diagnosed, I went in remission for seven months while she was having chemotherapy, um, radiotherapy. I actually used to go to her doctor's appointments with her and when she had radiotherapy. Um, they took me in and showed me around the room and showed me what the machine was doing and how it worked. And that boy was also going to the doctors with her. Um, and if mum couldn't sort of understand what they were saying, well, I used to ask them to break it down. What um, emotional and spiritual support I needed was from a very good friend of mine, who still today provides that support. 
and that's someone who's been there, someone you can have the hard conversations with, um, even though she's having her own issues and her own journey and her own battles with her health. The support is my daughter and my two very dear friends, Mug and Jill. Unless you've been through that or been told that, you really don't understand. The support I got from my wife and family, that was the main thing that got me through. But um, I've got to say it was pretty tough. My journey wasn't, it wasn't really, really bad, but it wasn't good either. But I do thank the people that I have in my life because I had, I had angels on earth. And I'm not a religious person, but I spoke to a friend of mine whose husband is, you know, a pastor. And I looked at her and I went, I seriously need you to pray for me because that's the way it was. Um, and, and I had that there and I had Kelly and I had Arnie Valder and I had all, all the people that were there were my angels. And... I had my daughter. I suppose you know who you will rely on. Some people may turn your, their backs, but the, the people that you think would, I found that I had people that I thought, oh, they'd be saying, oh, yeah, all right. But they have been the best support that I've had. You've just got to be strong and hold your head up and, work, and be there for the person in general, like the cancer patient themselves. It just, to me, like, I don't know, I don't like to show them that I'm scared or fearful of them going. So I can just, yeah, just keep strong and just keep going with what you're doing. I think it's important that for your own emotional well-being to actually find that one person who has been there or is going through it because that's when you can actually talk about things that you can't talk about with anyone else. Live life. Enjoy it. Stand strong. Don't be afraid to cry. Don't be afraid to reach out. My advice to people is that uh, uh, cancer is not a death sentence, but uh, to take it on and, and uh, be positive, uh, very positive towards this disease. Well, I think um, I should be talking to people that can help them to, to ask those questions, to get the information they need. Sometimes you need help to do that. Um, somebody to advocate on your behalf, to support you um, when you're sitting there and talking to a doctor or a specialist so they can actually put it in terms that you can understand. I'm not using medical terms, they're just designed to keep you out of the picture. And, you know, always look to see if there's a local Aboriginal health service close by that can actually be some of that advocacy role as well. So that Aboriginal health workers know what they're doing and they can support you and how you might uh, get to the bottom of what's going on. Some of our people, some of our elders, they don't want to tell everybody what's going on. How do you prepare yourself? You can't. Because you never know what's going to happen. You never know how long they've got. It's a journey you don't take on your own. Um, it's something to be shared because there are people out there that are angels and that's I just can't believe the angels that I have. And I know that they're always going to be there. And it might not show at first, but when times are tough, they come out. And you're not on your own. And there are people you can talk to. So, like my daughter said, suck it up. <laughs> she did. The first time I told her, she goes, suck it up because you're going to be okay. I found the, um, the journal a really good thing for me. Um, because I'm such an organised person, I found that that kept me on track. But also because I was forgetting things because of, I think, of all my emotions. And that actually helped me... Um, put down appointments, put down my emotions and um, write down people's names because I was forgetting, and that's not like me, of forgetting people or things to do. Um, I thought that was a really good thing. I found it very important to always have someone with me um, who could remember what the doctor told me, one, um, 
um, and um, ask questions that you don't think to ask. So uh, that was one of my mechanisms, was to make sure someone went with me. Don't leave the things till too late, go and get checked out. Make sure, it. tell other people to go along and have a check it.